on today's episode of the Cryptoverse. The Cointelegraph has picked out five ICOs to keep an eye on. So let's see what they are. Dash Detailed is a weekly YouTube show about the privacy-focused digital currency known as Dash. It is hosted by the lovely Amanda B. Johnson and keeps you right up to date about all the exciting developments in the Dash ecosystem. Click the link in the video description and subscribe today. Hi there guys and welcome to the latest episode of the Cryptoverse. Your regular dose of news and commentary on Bitcoin, cryptocurrencies and blockchains. My name is Chris Coney and I am the host of the Cryptoverse. Today is the 3rd of February 2017. So we are going to do the normal three step. Well, actually, normally it's two step, but today it's three step. Market roundup, Bitcoin price chart. It's actually four steps. We're going to look at Litecoin, Segwit, then get into the news. So let's get into it. Shout out to coinmarketcap.com for providing us with the cryptocurrency prices. The biggest winner of today in the double digits is NEM. NEM has gained 15%, 15.19 to be exact. And that's a big deal considering that NEM is in ninth position by market cap, putting a NEM token at 0.6 cents each, making the whole NEM blockchain worth about $60 million. Interesting observation here. In the top 10, there's this big leap. So you've got NEM at 60 million market cap, you've got MadeSafe at 68 million market cap, and then there's this enormous gap of about $50 million between MadeSafe and Ethereum Classic. It goes from 68 million, call it 70 million, to 120. What's that? 30, sorry, $52 million, give or take a few hundred thousand. And then the next one up, so it goes to, from 120 million for Ethereum Classic, just a, almost a million dollars exactly above that is Dash in sixth most capitalized coin. Then there's another $50 million leap to Monero at 178, and on and on we go, right? So that's interesting to see the, the differences between the uh, various top tens and what the gaps are. The other number that I like to look at, which I've not mentioned in a while because I didn't like the look of it, was at the top of coin market cap, it gives us the total market cap of the whole cryptoverse. And this is like how much money has gone into the crypto sphere in total, if you added up all the market caps. And at the minute it's $19 billion, or 16 and a half billion of which is due to Bitcoin's market cap. That's how come this BTC dominance figure is 86%. So let's, I like to look at those numbers. I wanna know how much of that fiat money or the value has been transferred into the cryptoverse. Anyway, let's look at the biggest loser today. I think we've got a double digit loser as well. Yes, we have. So Digix Dow was in the news yesterday. It's down there at 20th by market cap and it's lost 12.23% of its value. And that makes a Digix Dow token, actually the DGD token worth $9.59. Now, we know that DigixDAO, like I said yesterday, gold-backed cryptocurrency on the Ethereum network. And then NEM is a, they're going for the currency game and they're claiming completely bespoke code. It's not a fork of any other project. So on two-tiered system, you know, all that kind of stuff. Turning now to the Bitstamp price feed that's fed into the BitcoinWisdom.com price charts. Well, looky here. What do you know? We have the move up out of the ascending triangle that I called the other day. And what do you know? If I wave my hand over the candle for today, what does it say the high price of the day was? So far, the high of the day is $1,022.60, according to the Bitstamp price. And if you remember, I said when it broke out of the ascending triangle, my prediction was that the top, the top of the run would be $1,024. So pretty close, I would say. Now, to those of you in the comments that were like, would you stop doing this stupid technical analysis? Doesn't work. You're seeing patterns when they're not really there, blah, blah, blah. Well, how do you explain this then? How do you explain the fact that I went on record? And you can go back to the videos, which is why I said it on record. A lot of people who read the charts, they do it in retrospect. 
So they they see moves after they've already happened. And they go, oh yes, this is where the uh, support broke, and this is this, and this is that, right? BS, right? You need to call it before it happens. Otherwise, anyone can, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. Anyone could do that. But I was on record back here when it went before this move happened. And I actually called it. I said, this is an ascending triangle. Typically, this is what happens. The run up to the, into the triangle is equal to the breakout. And then I calculated it. $174 run in, $174 run out. Actually turned out to be $2 off. It was actually $172 run up. And it hasn't even finished yet. But near enough, $1,022. I called it $1,024. How do you explain that? If technical analysis is BS, how do you explain the accuracy of that prediction? I'll put that to you. Quick stop over at the Litecoin network to see if Segregated Witness is active. No, not yet. But it has started signaling as of, um, well, last night, I think it was. So let's see what the number is. Ding, ding, ding. Segwit minor support on the Litecoin network. 0.01%. Get in. So that's a start then, right? So the question is, how, do this, how does the system know what that number should be? Well, it's based on when, when someone mines a block, it's the version of that block that determines, that's how you tell the network, you know, what your vote is. So you'll look at like um, bitcointracker.co or something, and every block that is mined, it has a version in it to say we are a SegWit block or we are this block or we are Bitcoin Unlimited block or whatever. Um, so that's how this system is able to determine what the consensus is amongst miners. It's based on the blocks that have recently been mined and what those blocks say the miner supports, right? So I'm going to be checking it in on this tool every day now to see that number increasing. You know, I've got a hunch and it's it's just my intuition. This is going to pass on the Litecoin network. I've just got a feeling. I can't I can't rationalize it. So don't take it too seriously because it's, it's it's kind of beyond my conscious awareness why I think this, but I've just got a sense that it's going to pass on Litecoin. So let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you think SegWit is going to pass on the Litecoin network? within the year that it says here between uh, January of 2000, sorry, February of 2017 and February of 2018. So today for the news, we turn once again to the Cointelegraph, the future of money. This is William Suberg's article published, well, 17 hours ago, according to this. And they have published this article called ICO Roundup 2017 by Cointelegraph, cashing in on blockchain apps mainstream year. Well, Calling it ICR Roundup 2017, it's not entirely fair because we've only just started 2017. That's why, like, you have um, Best Movie 2017 and they released that award in January. It's like, well, you can't do that. But anyway, right, so many of you saw my Seven Industries episode yesterday and many of you liked it. So I thought we'd do another one of these while the vibe is kind of high. I'm not going to make a habit of this because that would just get boring. But well, let's go with the vibe, shall we? So it says, everyone from banks to blockchain taxi startups is convinced that 2017 will see the long-awaited global entry into decentralized tech. Um, what does that mean, though? How do you know when something has reached so-called mainstream adoption? Now, let me know in the comments below. How will you know when cryptocurrencies have reached a tipping point? I'm not talking about, well, I'll see it on the news. I mean... How, what's your criteria to convince yourself that, yep, it's tipped, right? Let me know that. So moving on here, the first of these projects, ICOs, is something called Melonport. Melonport is described as the Google on the blockchain, and it's built on Ethereum. It's a protocol that's built on Ethereum, allowing you to set up, manage, and invest in digital asset management strategies. Okay, now in the UK, if we say Melon, we usually mean our head. So you can imagine what initially came to my mind when I read the name of this pro project, Melonport. <laughs> so if someone says my melon, it means my head. Anyway, also, I don't I don't get this bit about the Google on the blockchain bit. That made me think like, oh, great, this is going to be a blockchain based search engine. Mm, turns out, no, it's a platform for managing digital assets. Um, how is that like Google again? I don't know. But it goes on to say, with the already giant number of places to invest cash in blockchain tech this year, Melonport attempts to provide a one-stop shop for managing those investments. Okay, good idea, but 
can't you already do this with crypto compare? Like for example, here's my crypto compare account, which is zoom in a little bit here so you can see it. So this is my crypto compare account. What you can do is I've added a Bitcoin wallet of mine here and it says, look, I've got 1.4 Bitcoins in there, da, 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 da. And you can tell it what price you bought it at and then it calculates, you know, the change. In fact, look, so I click add new coin. Say if I want to add some dash holdings in here, I select dash, 4.28 dash. Say I bought it at five quid. I'm just using that as an example. And then here where you click on advanced options, you can say this cryptocurrency is stored in a wallet. And then you can actually enter the address of that wallet. So if I paste an address from my Dash Core wallet in there, add to portfolio, boom. So it scans it. It sees that I've got that much Dash in there and I bought it at five quid. And then it's saying today, this is the price. based, And it's in pounds, right? Because it knows the exchange rate. I've set pounds as my uh, local currency. So that just for argument's sake, if I had bought those 4.28 Dash at five pounds, it's saying based on today's prices, that's a gain of 171%. And, and I just put those in as arbitrary figures. But the five pound thing, I, I can't remember what I bought the dash for. I just did that to show you that you can do that kind of thing, right? And this shows your individual investments in cryptocurrencies and it shows your overall uh, portfolio, right? Total gain, total loss, total value, etc. I guess the only criticism of this is that it's centralized. Crypto Compare are a company and you're basically sharing this information with crypto compare so yeah they could um they could make good use of this data couldn't they they could see how people's investments are distributed and that gives them really interesting insights about the whole ecosystem so that would be one downside for you privacy advocates and the paranoid among us so then moving on then the next one is this one you can pronounce in two ways it's it's human iq but it's all one word. So it's either human IQ or humanique. You could say it both ways. It says this is more of an infrastructure project than a business one. The startup will also use Ethereum to create a blockchain bank where no one is excluded. Even its graphical user interface is based on symbols, ensuring those who have difficulty reading still understand what they can do. Now, that is a stroke of genius, is it not? That simple design decision eliminates the need to translate the user interface. It means anyone can use the same version of the software because an arrow one way would be sent, the arrow the other way would be received, and most people can get their head around that, even if you're somewhat illiterate. I mean, if you were, if you were illiterate numerically, you probably shouldn't be messing around with cryptocurrencies, but you get the idea about not having to understand a particular language to use it. And it's simple moves like that that aim squarely at the user that make the difference between the winners and the losers, um, not necessarily who has the most advanced technology. And I'm, and I'm always talking about that. Anyway, in the blue, we have Git money. Users put their skills to work in a free marketplace and are paid in Bitcoin for fulfilling tasks set by other users. Rather than a mad scramble for jobs, a daily email details what needs to be done. So this is simplifying the whole jobs board you know, Elance type of thingy bob. And it's yeah, it's person to person, right? So pretty, pretty good. I think this would be quite an interesting job to have. People sometimes say that the reason they love their jobs is because, oh, it's never the same. You know, every day is different. Well, this is how this seems to me, is that you'd be like, right, get to your inbox, excited to open your email. What work am I going to be doing today, right? And you could be anywhere in the world, which is the thing they're going for, is, you know, um, the nomadic sort of freelance person who just opens their laptop in Thailand or whoever they are and goes, right, do a bit of work, get paid some Bitcoin and away they jolly well go. Now, again, in British slang, a git is an insult to a person. <laughs> it means ignorant, childish, you know, someone who is like an annoying teenager. So in that context, git money to someone in Britain would initially make us think, oh, so this is money for gits then. Now, I'm having a bit of fun with this, but as a branding and marketing veteran, these things do actually matter. This next one then is EtherX. It is aiming to produce a fully decentralized cryptocurrency exchange built on Ethereum smart contracts. Okay, in that case, EtherX is a terrible name because it expands to Ethereum exchange. 
Well, it's not an Ethereum exchange though. It's a decentralized exchange built on the Ethereum platform. And no one cares how it's built, they care what it does and whether it works. Now, whether it's built on Ethereum or is a standalone application like BitSquare doesn't matter that much. What matters to me is how EtherX is going to get around the chicken and egg problem that has held BitSquare back from exploding. Now, I'm not going to read the rest of this section because most of us know we need to move to a decentralized exchange model like yesterday. And in the meantime, local Bitcoins are doing a pretty good job of it. And it also says here that EtherX is going to be a crypto exchange while BitSquare is a decentralized crypto and fiat currency exchange. So to me, I would rather you donate money to BitSquare than invest it in the EtherX ICO. And finally, in the gray, we have Genosis. Sometimes an industry niche needs a healthy dose of competition and augers comes in the shape of Genosis. The platform can be used to make complex predictions on a whole range of events with one project concentrating on pre-auction artwork selling figures. So, you know, Augur is the decentralized predictions market built on the Ethereum platform. So this is good. When you set up a new business where there is already an established competitor, it would be foolish just to come in and directly oppose them. You're almost guaranteed to lose. So you have to come in with a different offer or preferably a better offer to the marketplace. In this case, it sounds like Genosis is going to be able to do something that Augur currently can't do, which are these complex predictions. So if demand for such a thing exists and Augur aren't serving that demand, Genosis has a business. To sum up then, what I was going to do is end this by picking my favorite, but I don't really have one. Out of everything that I've talked about today, BitSquare is actually my favorite project and it isn't even on the list. It's not even doing an ICO. In fact, they're in the process of changing their name because when they went to register BitSquare as a brand name, it was opposed by an existing brand who has a similar bit-oriented name. Now, these other apps are great and they are valuable contributions to the free society that we are building. But I believe that at the stage we're at, BitSquare represents as big an opportunity for the world of crypto than any of these other apps. So thanks for joining me today, guys. If you liked this episode, hit the like button. If you disliked it, hit the dislike button. Please leave me a comment below with some feedback and get subscribed. And please support the Cryptoverse and boost cryptocurrency adoption by going to cryptoversity.com forward slash podcast and becoming a patron. From a few dollars a month, you can secure Cryptoversity's future, get unlimited access to all Cryptoversity courses, and access a private patrons-only chat group where you get direct access to me. That is all for today, guys. I will be back on Monday with another episode of The Cryptoverse. So until then, it's me, Chris Coney, saying bye for now.